Okay, welcome everyone to How to Buy a Horse in Training, another week of our uh, weekly shows of how we, we tackle different parts of the industry and hopefully explain to you with the experts of how they do it and they answer your questions live. Once more again, we have our live Q&A function. Just click that button if you have any questions at all at any point of, during the discussion, we'd love to hear from you. Um, last week we had our Bargain Breezer, which has been an incredible response online since then. We've sold out two horses, I can tell you. So that's 200 units gone in a week, which is fantastic. And um, we're hoping now to push towards a third, a, tor, a third horse, which is very exciting, helping support the breeze of consigners, hopefully availing with a bit of value, and hopefully we can find a bargain rocket along the way. Um, if you want to be involved in that, it's in the chat function at the moment. Uh, the link is there. And if you're watching on YouTube, the link is below. Um, we're really, really excited to get going with that. We've had some great discussions this week um, in terms of picking out our shortlist and how we'll go about that all ahead of us for the next month. But the important part this week is our horses in training and how you go to what I describe as the sale of broken dreams, the, the, the sale where people say they give up on their horse and say, I want to sell that horse. And frequently it can be something that's disappointed them. And, they, and we are with three experts of taking what some might deem as disappointments and actually transforming them into um, horses that have brought amazing memories to the race courses of Ireland and England over the last couple of seasons. Um, and we have with us Dennis Hogan, Stephen Torn, and Chris Dixon. So we're going to first have a look at this week, we're going to talk about why a horse in training. Why would you start in a horse in training sale with a prospective owner? Stephen, if I could turn to you, like when you have a new owner coming into the yard, I suppose, first of all, to describe your background, your assistant trainer to your uncle, Adam McGuinness, why do you turn to the horses in training as a, as a place to buy bloodstock for, for your stable? Well, I suppose, uh, Jack, thanks for having me on. Um, look at it, it, it it's, it's it's an area that we, we've tended to send new owners to the last couple of years. Uh, Aidan's been doing it a long time himself, but we specifically target this, the, the horses and training sales the last few years um, with the intention of trying to bring in new ownership. Um, horses that are pretty much, you know, they have a rating, they have a, you know, they per performed well on the track and you're, you're looking to try and get a horse with a rating that can hopefully try and repay his training fees and, and give the owners a day out. Um, Obviously, the yearling market is a little bit trickier. Um, um, probably, as I said, you, you discussed last week, the breeze of market, you, you've got the advantage of seeing these horses breeze in front of you, but they still haven't run. Um, obviously, Dennis has had great luck uh, buying these unraced horses out of the horse and training sales, and, and he'll tell you a little bit more about those. But uh, from, a, from our point of view, we, we try and go for the proven horse that with, with, a, with a good good handicap rating that he can he can most definitely... Uh, barring something goes seriously wrong that he can repay his training fees and give the owners a good day out at the races and, and an, an initial introduction to race horse ownership is very important to, that they have a good first time out experience at the, at the game that's essentially why we why we turn to this fear and Chris you know we have Dennis and we have Stephen both you know represented great training organizations within Ireland uh, but you're a little bit different if you want to describe your background and how you got involved in the horse and training sales um yeah hi jack hi everyone thanks for having me um well i principally did it um I, I don't come from a background of having worked in a in a yard or in the industry i come from a, a background as a punter and uh, a career in broadcasting and principally i th there were two driving factors for me to get involved in owning horses um one was for the fun and the enjoyment of it but the main one was to try and learn because i feel that ultimately it's something that's helped me um, in my work, in my profession, I suppose, um, is what I've learned by getting involved. And I was never going to be able to um, gain the experience that I have if, unless I invested in a horse and, and got to go and see a horse at home, get to learn the ins and outs of the problems that you get. And I ultimately feel that it, it made me a better punter and a, a better of, of my job as a, as a broadcaster and analyst for racing TV. So that was why I did it. In terms of horses in training well that's where my skill set lay as a punter and analyst um looking at horses that have been on the track trying to assess their form their attributes the things that might not have gone right for them um marking horses up and things like that um so that was the reason for the horse in training and the other thing with the horse in training market is a bit like the the horses that dennis has had success with you're able to buy horses at a price that is 
significantly lower than what it may have been as a younger horse in, in a number of cases. And, and there is opportunities, they're not all good opportunities, but there are opportunities to buy horses that ultimately as a, as a yearling, you wouldn't get anywhere near. And Chris, when you, you kind of touched upon how, you know, for you and a lot of people, when they tune in every week to these shows, they've been kind of, they're taking steps themselves to learn about the industry, to earn, you know, to further their knowledge. And you've said, well, one of the great ways you've learned about the industry is actually getting involved with get, buying horses and training. If they're looking for the kind of, you know, the kind of shortcut route, what would you say the highlights are, are things that have you, you've learned over that process that you would impart to them tonight and say to them as these are, things that I've taken away from when I started that process to where I am today? Um, I, I think it, you, you're constantly learning. I think when you go into it, you've got to sit down and think, um, where are your knowledge gaps? What is it that you want to learn? And if you're going to go in, if, if you're um, a punter or someone that likes analysing form and that is your background and you feel that, um, that you're good at it and you want to test your, your knowledge and ability in that regard by having a different type of bet which is essentially what you're doing by taking on a horse in training i think you've got to be aware of where your knowledge gaps are what it is that you want to learn and, and who can teach you that and for a lot of people like me it'll be going to get involved in a yard that have got uh the time for you um and that are going to help you get involved um in that buying process and you've got to trust them with various parts of, of what you don't know about. The big thing that I've learned is, is on a horse's physical, uh, spotting areas of unsoundness and things like that, that ultimately I didn't have a clue about. I'm nowhere near the kind of expert that uh, the rest of the panel would be, but I know a lot more than I did. So that, that's something that I wanted to learn about. And also just what goes into training a horse and therefore can link it back as a punter to why horses might run badly and, and how you can forgive them because you know that things happen along the way. And Dennis, when you know, when you pick up a horse and training catalogue, it's done so many times before and you're you know you've got new owners in the yard and they've said, Dennis, look, we only have ten grand to spend. We only you know we are we're a country syndicate in Ireland or we, you know we're a group of friends in London and the UK. We want to throw a few quid together and give you a horse to train. When you're picking up a horse to train and catalogue, you're flicking through those lots. Like, what are things that jump out of you that you like to see that you think, right, this might be a bit of value? Yeah. Hi, Jack. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I suppose um, I've been doing the horse and training sales for a good few years now, and I won't say expert, but uh, we, we, we have, we've been lucky. Um, but as Chris just pointed out there, um, look, look, Dustin, just arrive on your door. Either you have to... Um, I suppose the, the the problems what what problem identify what problems they have Jack and um, kind of work from there and look at the form and that but um, it's it's just a a place we've been able to operate at a budget and we've been able to form new syndicates time after time um, I'm able to head to a horse and training sale and maybe buy three four or five horses and when they're that cheap they they're generally all on spec I just sort them out when I get home and most of my owners nowadays will will nearly before I get on the plane back from the sales or home from the sales they're they're looking at the results constantly refreshing and can I have this or can I have that or who's he for if there's no one for him I'll take him um or what issues have they but it's it's been a great source it's been my best source I couldn't work without it because I probably couldn't compete in the earning in the earning ring we are getting a few nowadays on this on the back of of what we've done with some some uh, horses from in training sales yeah and you know our, our next our next kind of moment we want to dwell on is finding that value and you've talked about you know things you can accept and what was the issue on that one when people are looking through the list and they're seeing what horses you've bought what are the things in your experience that buyers you know might not accept uh ordinarily but you have seen value in and you've seen proven time and time again in the ring that that's uh that's some a source that you'd actually probably accept where others wouldn't I suppose in the early days, um, going to these sales, you'd see individuals that you'd actually like and you'd say, God, why is he, supposed to have to ask the question, why is he here and why is he so cheap? Um, generally a reason, but like, 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 likewise with the yearlings, um, when I go to them sales and I see the, the amount of vetting and x-rays, just think to myself, if we were to do all this, we probably wouldn't have any horses in the yard because you have to forgive 
the reason we're able to buy them is because it's an issue. But we work work around to see if we can resolve the issue or if we can help them with a wind operation or time off or if they're weak. Um, yeah, I suppose we'd be looking for we'd be looking for a, an individual to start with, and then we look at his form and or his form might draw us to look at him as an individual, and then we we look at his veterinary veterinary cert. And um, I suppose I've been very lucky, Jack, with those Godolphin those Godolphin dispersals. Um, I find Godolphin very upfront with their with their veterinary issues, and 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 they'll give you all the notes before we even get to the sale. Once the catalog is printed, we get the notes. Um, and they're very upfront that they don't really hide anything. Whereas there's no one, no one obliging them to um, to print all this stuff, but they do. They're they're very upfront, and we've been very lucky with their unraced horses, as Chris was just saying. Um, or or Stephen was saying. I think it's because we they have such good breeding, have such good pedigrees, and a lot of them take a bit of t- some of them take a bit of t- more time than others. So we're willing to buy willing to buy them in the autumn and put them away for at least the winter if not for a year and let them develop and, and then then go to war i suppose to describe that for people because people might not be aware but um darley and godolphin they, they should be commended for it. what they do for every horse they sell be the breeding stock sales or be the horse and training sales if you ring them up or you, if you send them an email they will send you a list with all the issues that horse has ever had if it had colic as a yearling if it had um you know, some kind of surgery along the way, that's all readily available and there for people to access. Um, and it's something that you really mind because I suppose from your perspective, you might not have the, the money to vet these horses every single time, but if you have the transparency and it's to be commended that could do it, you have been able to pick up, make a challenge for six and a half grand or um, uh, you've been able to find Skeptical for 2,800. They've both been darly cast-offs that you've had the confidence to buy from them because they're they're transparent and they're open for for your buy, your owners. Yeah, exactly. I've uh, I've to be honest, if if it's a if it's a good alpha and, um, and we've got the notes, then at least I know what we're dealing with. I can show the notes to my vet. We can go through them after we get them home, and we can see what needs surgery wise, or if he needs time or whatnot. Um, but I find them very very upfront, and and it's. It's a place we like to go back to because it's been so good to us, and they've such good breeding. Like, you have to remember, mo- most of these, most of these um, special horses have been through the ring for upwards of in around half a million, or or we've we've bought we've bought horses that that had cost over a million in the past, but um, they've ended up going back through the ring as three-year-olds for for a fraction of that. And Stephen, you know, it's very, it's really interesting here with Dennis talk about that and and talk about you know flaws and accepting them. But for you, when you do involve a vet and you know you've you've done so successfully uh, so many times, is how important is that relationship and how you kind of involve a vet in, in into the uh, process of picking out a horse and training? Yeah, I think it's vital, um, Jack. I, I I think the importance of a vet uh, once all the work is done, obviously when you've when you've when you've gone through your horses, you've done your short lists, you've looked at your race videos, and these are the these are the list of horses that you want. Um, depending on obviously what orders you have, you're fitting them into different brackets: your cheap horses, your middle market horses. Depending on what you're going to that sale to look for, but regardless of whether it's a ten grand horse or a, a fifty grand horse, or you know, or in some cases even a cheaper horse than that, I think that just the importance of a vet just to clinically look over that animal. And, and assess him and he might pick up on something that you haven't noticed and and uh, as I said you, you're there at the sale all day and you're looking at a lot of horses you can miss things and uh, I just think it, it's a great um, they're just they're, they're brilliant um, I, I use a guy in Newmarket there uh, from Baker McVeigh and and, and and he's a fantastic guy and I've built up a good relationship with him and he knows what I'm willing to accept and what Ado is you know is what Ado likes as well in terms of the, the physical makeup of a horse that that he can go and train then so um you know you know endoscopic examinations sort of the, the the scope as they call it you know just to check their their larynx and that just all basic clinical examinations then and uh, just put the picture of the puzzle together i suppose and just give you confidence going into the ring that there's nothing untoward in the animal you're buying and Chris, you know, a lot of people online now, they, they might be racing fans, but they might not be horsemen or women. They're, they're people that love the game, love reading the form book, just like you did. 
um, and want to apply that in a, in a kind of unique way, which is the horse and training sales. And I suppose what I'm interested to hear is how you think about veterinary issues and how you think about maybe the form book and, what, and when you're picking up the catalogue and you're kind of creating your uh, shortlist for the horse watchers and the, all the other entities that you buy for, what are the things that you're thinking about where you might think, okay, there, there might be a little gem here um, beneath it all? Uh, there's a, a number of, of different things that you're looking at. In terms of the analysis, it, it goes through a um, probably a, a few stages, um, the analysis that we do. Ultimately, form and video analysis is the biggest part of what we do. That's the, the syndicate of four of us in the horse watchers. We're all punters and race readers. The other three were all time form staff um, along the way. So they're extremely good um, at, at at analysing races, I suppose, and that's what we try and do. As I said, that's where our skill set is. So that's in, initially we're looking at um, what we like about the attitude of a horse, or indeed dislike. Uh, we're looking at the strength of form, excuses that we can make for them. Pedigree analysis is a big thing, and, and tying back that to the way that the horse has campaigned. Um, is it a precocious pedigree, a, a slower burning pedigree? Um, those kind of things, and the physical analysis um, for us. We largely lean on Nick Appleby, who's trained most of our horses for us. He's excellent at spotting that. And it's what uh, Dennis said there about kind of once you get to a horse in training sale, you, you're not anywhere near as worried about confirmation and things like that. You're looking at how the horse that's in front of you has stood up to training and racing at this point um, and, you know, uh, uh, being slightly crooked in front if, it, if it's not showing any signs of particular wear and tear on, on those joints as a result of that then it doesn't bother you quite so much as it would do maybe in, in an unraced horse so you're looking at what you can manage and deal with you're looking at how that horse has stood up to it that to that point um, and that is definitely a big part of it we also use vets you mentioned there to Stephen uh, about a vet the principal reason for our vetting is exactly what Stephen said it gives you that little bit of extra confidence if um, Mick and, and then the, the lesser qualified eye of, of the others in the syndicate have missed something. It, it's just something else that might be spotted. And getting the scope done for the, just to have a look at their larynx is definitely a help as well because you can just um, rule anything out with, with that and, or indeed think, well, that's what's been stopping in its races. We might well be able to, to sort something out. So there's so many different factors that you are considering and ultimately when you get that autumn horse in training catalog with 1500 plus horses in it there's a lot of work to go through um digging through them all and, and analyzing them them in depth and some of them you strike out quickly others you you dig into deeper sometimes you absolutely love when you get there on the day and you have to rule it out because of the physical and Chris, I suppose it's interesting to hear you because you, you really you, you do a wonderful job of buying good value horses for your owners. And I think what's striking about it is, and what I would have a worry when you go to a, when you have a vet is what happens when a vet comes down to a stable? It raises vendor expectations. They, they see a, a stethoscope, their eyes light up. How do you balance kind of vetting horses without raising expectations to ruin the possible value that you might avail of without vetting because you won't have marked their card so um, clearly this is a horse of interest to you uh, yeah I mean I uh, in terms of us going and looking I look at a load of horses that have absolutely no interest in <laughs> um, so if, if there's if there's uh, a consignment of of say five horses from one place there might only be one that we're interested in and I'll look at all five um, I definitely do that. In terms of sending a vet to them, well, we, we send a vet to everything. We, I use um, either Kate, who works at Newmarket Equine Hospital, or we take Mick's vet with us. Um, he'll come down. He's ultimately the fellow that is going to be dealing with this horse and, and managing these horses along the way. Um, and so he'll either say, that's completely clean, you're fine to, to crack on with that, or he'll say, there's this issue, but I think we can manage it. Um, so, so that's our way of doing it but it, it doesn't worry me too much for the, the little bit of extra that you might pay by raising someone's expectations I guess you probably long term save yourself by avoiding a couple of disasters that I'm sure we would have bought without having horses vet, uh, vetted
and I suppose a question then for Dennis is, you know, how important is it that you have a relationship with an agent, that someone out there scouting for you, that they're work hustling, you know, you have a great relationship with Colm Sharkey who buys a lot of your horses. Is that something you, you think is important to your setup? Yeah, uh, definitely, Jack. Um, in the early days, I didn't have anyone. I just soldiered away on my own. But as I was doing the sales, I got to know a lot more people, as you do. And I suppose the column's been very good to me. He's been he's picked out some super horses all down the years. And I suppose what the likes of Colin does um, is he'd have the catalogue. He'd have been through the catalogue, which I don't have time to do. And I don't fancy sitting down to do it either, like, We'll say going through all the form, what they're what they're rated since the catalogue was printed and what they've done and the updates and what they're related to and what issues they had and I suppose he knows plenty in the racing game and he's in around Newmarket as well and he's he, he, he hears plenty going around and that's another big part of the of the um in training sales. It's um there's a there's a lot of word uh, about after a horse has been racing and had a couple of runs a lot more than the trainer knows a lot about that horse and there's plenty, plenty goes around and you, you, you take in bits as you go and look at Colm and different agents have looked at horses with me or for me and they've, they've told me, no, there's an issue here, we can't, we won't even look at this because for whatever reason. And I went back and bought a horse on, on my own behind their back and they'd ask me after, <laughs> I thought we said we weren't, I thought we agreed we weren't touching this and I just said, I liked him too much. We'll worry about the problems after. On my head, be it. On my head, be it. <laughs> but uh, so Steve, I'm, I'm interested to hear your perspective. You know, you, horse and trainer sales is kind of a unique dynamic because you're going to that sale and you're you're a trainer uh, and you're represent. You know, re there with Adam McGuinness, and you were saying to this other trainer, "I'm going to take your horse and improve it." But how do you manage that dynamic and make sure you're getting good information from other trainers? Um. In, well, the question is, Jack, how, sorry, say that again. Well, well, I suppose the question is, you know, you're saying that uh, I'm going to buy your horse, you know, X trainer, and I'm going to improve that horse, you know, and it's about the, I said, the degree of honesty you need there, that you're, you know, that you trust the trainer, that, you, that what they're telling you, this horse might have talent for you to go on and improve, or perhaps that you you kind of just kick on anyway. You might back your, your own uh, abilities there and think this is one we can improve. How do you think about, other trainers when buying their horses at a horse and training sale because of course at a yearling sale you know it's anyone's game and the horse has never been broken so it's a it's a new it's a new start there but at a horse and training sale the dynamics a little bit different yeah i get your question now um okay but you, you can't as i said it, everyone has access to the internet these days and i suppose i'm a big stats man so pre-sale you know in terms of the trainers that we buy off we look at a list of horses of uh, trainers that might I've had an off season, if you get me, or, or you know, uh, identify trainers that have had a bad run, if you like. Um, toppled with, obviously, naturally enough, the horse is the most important. Like, it, it, but it, if 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 it's a horse that we really like, a uh, particular horse that we really like, um, you know, the, the 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 trainer, as I said, you can get a little bit of value there if if a horse has been out of form for a period of time, and maybe it's it's as a result that the trainer has had a bad run. Uh, it's another. It's a, maybe it might be more of an of an angle for value, but in terms of improving them, um, Jack. I mean, it, we buy off some very very good trainers. Uh, the past couple of years, we bought we bought um bought um current option out of Willie Haggis's last last July. Um, a high profile horse, a three year a nice three year old horse. But I mean, Willie Haggis is one of the best trainers in the UK in my view. Now. Uh, Gelding that horse, uh, we, we brought him home and we castrated him and, and it made a massive difference to him. Um, so that's another area, maybe a colt, a highly strong colt in Newmarket. Uh, he might have been in training with um, a lot of horses around the place. And take, him or take him out of that environment and you bring him home. Uh, he was obviously castrated. He settled down straight away. Um, obviously looking at his race videos, um, he he was a very keen horse in his races, um, and we just thought that if we if we got him home and castrated him and, and got him to settle, which we did, uh, the guys at home done a great job. Uh, that that was the angle to to improve him that horse. Um, but like I said, it's it just comes down to um, you know it boils down to the horse at the end of the day, um, and maybe sometimes you can find an angle from a, 
a, a trainer that might just be mightn't be having a, a run of things uh, up, up to the sale. The horse is going to the sale because he has to be dispersed uh, in order for the trainer to get more money in to buy yearlings. Um, so you, you've got that. Maybe you run out of time with that horse, and 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 you can find value because that horse has been out of form for a, for a period of time. And. Dennis, a question from you from Stephen O'Connor on our Q&A function, and that, that is, you know, how do you manage owner's expectations? You know, here, here you are buying, you know, an, a six and a half grand make a challenge. You won six races last year, but sometimes, you know, it doesn't always work out. How do you balance that expectations with trying to attract new owners into the yard and making sure they have a positive experience? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's for sure. It doesn't always work out, Jack, and uh, that has to be highlighted as well. That's why I suppose we're on a budget for we're on like I suppose between zero to ten K or you know that you know that the, it, it, something something might not work out here and this horse mightn't perform at all and there's a valid reason he's been sold because they can't train him or whatever. But um but how do you how do you manage their expectations? Um I suppose we, we tell them as it is, we tell them the issues and and um we tell them what we're gonna do and if it you know, it is a gamble. It is a gamble for sure. Make a challenge was a gamble. He was unraced. He was backward weak. We knew very little about him. But by invincible spirit, he had a top class pedigree. He cost 600k as a yearling. Um, I said, why don't we just put him away, give him a bit of time, and see how he does next year? And when he came in, he didn't show didn't show anything really. I thought, God, I'm not. I still, I still, I still had 100 percent of him. I, I couldn't put him to anyone because he wasn't showing anything and. Um, he started to show a bit. I said this time last year he, well, he he did show a bit, but he actually had an issue with stalls and he refused to race on three occasions and he was very nearly he was very nearly moved on again from my yard and um, he's lucky I had had some good staff to to get his to get the stalls sorted out and um, we didn't look back really after that last summer. Yeah. He certainly didn't do that. He didn't look back at all. Um, but I, I, Chris, a question from you, and it's uh, from Rebecca O'Sullivan, and she's talking. You know, she's asking about the impact of syndicates and the you know the, the positivity that they bring. You know, how important do you think they are to the horse racing ecosystem and uh, bringing new people into the game? I think they're really important. Um, the the syndicate that we've got, uh, the Horse Watchers, is is principally. Uh, four friends, myself, my brother, and a couple of mates. That's that's uh, our syndicate. But we've we've also got a thing called Slipstream Racing, which the members of Slipstream initially were were all owners within a yard, and we just decided to club together to get a few horses for the all weather season um, uh, two years back, and, and we did it again this year. Um, but I think they're really important. My first ever sharing horse, something that really got the the initial bug for for wanting to, to have a go at it was a really small share in in a, a fairly big syndicate with a lot of people in it. And then I just wanted a bit more control. I wanted to have a go myself. But I think the huge important for, for a number of reasons. It, it gives you an opportunity, it gives everyone an opportunity because so many different um, share sizes are available for people to, to buy into. So whatever your budget win, you can have a go. Um, and I think it's a, a stepping stone. There aren't that many people probably around nowadays that will that have the the means to just go and buy a few horses in training. Um, so by being part of a syndicate, you might even become someone that would have had one horse and you can have a leg in four for the same price and, and just maybe have a few more goes at it, a few more days out. And you get that shared enjoyment as well, which is a, a big part. Of it. You've got a common cause that you're all together and working towards. And, and I really enjoy that part of it. But I think it's a stepping stone for people as well that do want to have their own horse. You can go in at a lower level, have a, a 10% share, say, and then ultimately a couple of years down the line decide that you want to go it alone. But it provides a, a gateway, I suppose. And Stephen, I suppose, you know, building on Rebecca's question to Chris, you know, you also run Shamrock Turbreds, which syndicates, you know, uh, a number of excellent horses there with Adam McGuinness. You bought Laugh a Minute in the recent Autumn Horse and Training Sales. You know, you're constantly syndicating horses as well. And have you seen in your own yard people 
kind of go on that journey. So they have, you know, a small share in one horse and then that builds to a couple of horses and then they may buy their own horse. Have you seen that kind of evolution with Edo? Yeah, yeah, big time. I think it's probably one of the most important factors why we've, we've kept syndicating these horses because these guys with five, 10% shares, you know, our sponsor, Bart, the late Bart O'Sullivan, um, his son James has taken over the whole thing at the moment. But, uh, you know, he, he started, started out with a 20% share in, in, a, in a cheap horse and he's built to two or three horses there in the yard and he sponsors our yard heavily as well. So, and um, yeah, we just, all the time, you know, I was a, little, a little interest initially and all of a sudden, if, if, if they've had a very, very good experience and, and that's the whole trick uh, to get the right horse, to, get the, to syndicate the right horse and, and the proven horse is the way, the route we have gone because you know, as I said, bar and accident, there will be a good day in or somewhere, and then that you know you're you're you've given them a great first time ownership experience, and then they can then they're they're turning to you then, and they're they're giving you an order then to go and buy a horse solely for them, and and, and it has happened. You know. Okay, great. Well, I want I think we're going to now kind of delve into the specific purchases in the last kind of twelve months, and to t- discuss kind of why we went you know those in particular horses in training and how they worked out so well. Because um, I think that's particularly interesting for people. And Dennis, I know you've all, this is a picture of Makeup cha- Challenge, the joyous scenes after he won at Galway. Um, but I'm also interested to hear about Skeptical. You know, it was so impressive in Dundalk. Uh, James McCauley, I saw during the week, said, this horse is not for sale. He was brilliant when he won the dock, Dundalk. He, he got 115, which is the exact same rating Make a Challenge got. And Make a Challenge was fifth in the group one. Um, what's the story to, behind his... Uh, uh, you know, efforts in the yard and how he's become a trailblazer for you and his purchase. Yeah, I suppose um, again and again. I think it was Doncaster this time. Uh, got off from dispersal um, last August or September. Um, it was last August, must have been because I was at the I was at the horses and training and sale in Newmarket when he made his debut in Dundalk. Um, we didn't think he was ready, nowhere near ready, but. Uh, Again, we thought we'd be going down the handicap route. We just pitched him in, and I uh, broke slowly. Um, Travel well. He was he was only beaten. He was only beaten a head or a neck, I think. Um, but he um, he had been making a noise back then, and his wind wasn't perfect. And we've been trying to tongue tie on him, but uh, after that, after that day, I think we, we went and done his. We went and done, sorry, we went and won with him the following week. We won his maiden the following week, and he was. Still making a very bad noise, and I thought we didn't think he could be capable of doing what he was doing. At the noise he was making, so we went and went wind over the winter, and he ended up bolting off, bolting up off a rating of ninety. And he's now gone to one one four. I suppose getting back to why why we ended up acquiring him was uh, James James and Stephen McCauley. They they picked this guy out. They actually they really picked him out because of the sire exceed and excel. They're absolutely mad about him. They've had um, Hatik and they've had a God, I can't think of other horse's name, but we've had a really good exceed in Excel horse. But um, he's a very, very popular sire with them, and they spotted this guy in, in sales catalogues in the past, and he didn't appear. But he ended up appearing this guy this day. And I remember on the flight on the way on the way over there, they were saying this is the one we're coming for, and um, they picked him up for two thousand eight hundred and. They were delighted with that, so they had they even had money to spare that day, and they bought two or three or four more, I think. Um, and it actually was a really good sale for them. Um, we we we, bought, we got a couple of winners out of that day, yeah. And I think just to dwell on that, because it's an extraordinary statement to make. You know, here is a hundred and fourteen, one hundred and fifteen race and post rating horse, and it was bought for two thousand eight hundred. You know, and that just shows for so many people that are watching. And so the, like, the dream is alive for people. If they go out there, they go to the horse and training sale, they can have success and they can have, uh, you know, a, a, an amazing adventure with buying a racehorse, which is something just so powerful. And I suppose a question that um, Keen Hurley had for you, and that, and that is, you know, unraced horses, is there a particular reason that's been successful for you, do you think? Is, or, you know, is there, you know, would you be open to explore any option? I actually, I actually lean toward more towards the unraced nowadays, um, just because I've been lucky for us. But um, no, like don't get me wrong, there's plenty that never see we buy and never see the track too. But it costs far money, so they haven't broke anyone, you know. Um, but 
is there a reason for that, Jack? Um, no, like Stephen hit on earlier on, these, these are massive breeding operations like Godolphin, Aga Khan, Judmont, Shadwell, Coolmore. They're, they're huge operations. They have numbers of yearlings coming through this autumn. So all these three-year-olds, unless they're black type or group horses, are going to be sires. They're, they're going to be moved. So they're, they're looking for new homes. They're not, not exactly cast-offs. They're decent, decent horses and very well bred. So I have no problem. Like they, they have, just haven't got to the track some of these three or a two or three. They haven't they've had hold-ups and they've been weak. And this skeptical was a huge horse. He's 16-2 plus. He's a big, long horse. He wouldn't have matured until he was four year old anyway. So at that money I was like our James and the lads were they were gonna they were gonna chance him for a few more bids. So um, even even making a noise that it wasn't gonna be enough to stop them buying them. Well there you have it. If you had given Dennis Hogan and James McCauley ten grand, he would they would have bought you a six and a half grand make a challenge and a two thousand eight hundred and uh, skeptical, and you would have had change for the drinks afterwards from ten grand, and you'd have two top class sprinters. You know, an amazing achievement. And we turn to Stephen Torn, and there's there we just talked about him, the late great Bart O'Sullivan, Stephen, and this is Saltonstall, and you might you might talk a little bit about the story of him winning in Galway uh, this last summer. Yeah, it was a it was a it was probably the highlight of the summer last year, um, Jack. And uh, look, we got a. A, a brand new team of, uh, you know, a team of owners behind this horse. Uh, obviously, Bart was the instigator of it. Um, got the Dooley's involved. James Dooley there on the right of the picture there, and his family, uh, Mark and Dave, and um, his mother as well there in the picture. Bart's wife on the left there. But uh, they've had look at it. it was a, it was a special day. Um, we looked at this horse. In October, um, it was actually come up in the horse and pony sale in, in Goffs in Ireland, and um, uh, initially went and looked at the horse. Um, it was it was it was one of the Godolphin um, horses that was in the dispersal, but it was obviously you know trained by Mick Halford, um, and you know it said it when he pulled out of the box, he one of those horses is just a very striking horse, you know, um, big, good looking, strong horse, and. That's the type of horse that we've been leaning towards the last couple of years. Um, just a big, strong type that where, where there's plenty of longevity in these in, in, a, in a horse like this. And um, I said, there's no secret to the fact that this horse was, um, you know, his three previous starts, you know, were, were very poor. And um, you're obviously looking to know then why he ran so poorly. And, you know, they were very open to the fact that this horse was a bleeder. Um, and as I said, you... You, know, you take a horse like this, uh, had won a Premier Handicap a couple of months previous to us buying him, went off second favour for the Royal Hunt Cup. Um, and then, actually, I remember, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then he, 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 uh, uh, he actually went off favour for the Galway Mile the, previ the, the, the previous year as well and ran dismal and the same in the Cambridgeshire, but they just couldn't get him right. And they obviously ran out of time with this horse. Um, uh, you know, but that's what I'm saying. It, the relationship you can build up with these... Uh, these vendors or consigners um, and Mick was very adamant, uh, Mick Halford himself, that there was a big day in this horse and he, he was probably the one that really gave me the most confidence going by. And obviously the bleeding aspect was a real issue and um, I had a, uh, nearly had an argument with Edo going into the ring about buying, over buying this horse but I really wanted him, I really liked him, vetted, vetted very well but as I said, a winter off um, in a new environment, we're, we're quite close to the coast here and we got a multitude of fresh air, you know, coming into our barns. Um, you know, we turn our horses out with small little things, and um, it took it took us a while to get this this horse right. Um, his first couple of runs for us wasn't great, and maybe the fact that he dropped in the ratings a little bit just gave the horse a chance, if you like. And you know, after Derby weekend, the plan last year was was Galway, and he he didn't disappoint. And he wasn't the only one that uh, rated so successfully a Premier Handicap last year because he also, from the horse and training sales, bought current option. And you touched upon it already, you know, bought from William Haggis, such a talented trainer in Newmarket. What was it about him that made you think, you know, he might be one for us? And how did he uh, become such value? Um, 
we, we looked at the horse uh, along with another Camelot horse who we actually bought in the same draft on the same day. He came up about 10 loss later. We thought he was the only one we could afford. But um, this was a horse that um, was heading for Australia. I, I have no doubt about that. Only uh, his vetting um, on the day uh, just didn't pass uh, the Aussies. Um, and there was, a, the, you know, our vet, this is where our vet came in and the importance of having a good vet. Like our vet stressed to me that there was absolutely nothing wrong with this horse and um you know there was a small little a small little gray area on a, on a, on a or a, you know a, on a hind fetlock joint and as i said this horse was a hundred percent sound he was in great condition at the sale and um you know he gave us confidence going into the ring i didn't think we'd be able to buy him um a three-year-old very unexposed called um with masses of movement to come open. Um, I said we, we, we took him home we castrated him um, and uh, obviously produced him the first day in Cork was second in the Cambridgeshire won the big race on Champions Weekend uh, last year and he's had a good winter off and he'll be ready to start next month he's got and hopefully there's another big day in him off um, he's, he, I think he's went up to 94 but we, we think there's, I think he's a, a first day animal now if, if we have one in the yard I think we think he's it um, but as I said Without our vet on the day, um, we probably wouldn't have had the confidence to go in and buy him. Um, but we, you know, the, the, the vet played a huge role in, in, in sourcing that horse. So there you have it. One for the notebook, current option for the 2020 season, which of course returns on June 8th. We're all very excited here in Ireland. Um, we're back racing on June 8th, which would be great. And I suppose, Chris, then, if we turn to you, and Chris, you sent me this. Uh, an exhaustive list of every horse you've bought in the last couple of years, all there. And I actually tried to put it on the screen, but I couldn't because it was just so extensive of all the different ones. I thought it was great transparency that you'd show not only the good ones, but the, you know, the, the ones that didn't go so well. And this is, you know, you might want to talk about him a little bit. This is a big country and he was a great success story for you. Again, rated 112, race and post rating, uh, a real uh, flag bearer for the horse watchers. Yeah, he was. He, he was a, a, a fabulous horse. And I sent you that full list because you don't always get it right, clearly, that there are, there are horses that, that go wrong along the way. And um, Big Country was one. Every, every horse that, that we bought along the way, we had absolute faith in at the time buying it. Some of the really cheap ones, you're kind of looking and thinking that they'll just nick a little race somewhere or... You know, you might be buying them with a mark around 60 or something and, and you think they're a 75 horse, so you've got something to work with. You can have a little bit of fun. But Big Country was always a horse that we felt was going to go quite a long way. We didn't believe, I suppose, that he was going to get quite to the heights that he did. He ended up winning a listed race for us. Um, we had some absolutely fabulous days with him, including that day at, um, at Kempton in the Rosebury where he's winning the Sylvester. And that was just his second run for us. He'd, He'd won at Wolverhampton the time before that. And, and he was just a, a wonderful horse to be involved with. And, and he was bought for a price that I didn't believe we'd get him for. We, we were willing to spend more, but I didn't think that we would even buy him on the budget that we had. Um, and I was amazed that we got him. It, it was a case with him of um, he was an unexposed horse with a good pedigree, a slow maturing pedigree. You can see he's a, he's a big horse. He might not have been model of a horse that some people liked and, and it was I suppose something that we were not too bothered about we liked the size of him we liked the way that he moved and we liked the way that he's it shaped in his races and he was a maiden um, who we felt at worst would just reproduce what he'd done and, and win a little maiden or a novice on the all weather over the winter but we always believed that he was a horse that was going to progress and, and that's exactly what he did but I should have said earlier on when you said to me, what have you learned along the way? Um, the big thing that I've learned is that you trust your eyes and not your ears. And it's the same with the background in betting. Um, but when you get to the sales, you hear an awful lot of stuff. But going back to the point about value, if you've heard it, if I've heard it, certainly, then plenty of other people have heard it. Whereas not everyone else knows what the four of us are thinking. And so... I guess that's, that's a way of finding value. And the, the biggest thing that I've learned is trusting your eyes and not your ears. And with this horse, I think a few people obviously didn't like him. And if we'd have listened to that, we wouldn't have ended up buying. 
you know, and a, this is a 28 grand horse and he, run, you know, uh, he gets to 112. It's a great testament to you and the team. And I suppose a lot of people are going away and we've had some questions for you, Chris, here on our Q&A function about this. And they're, they're keen to learn. They want to, you know, they want to look at resources. You've talked about a lot of people that you've been involved with X time form. They, they are, you know, stat, statos, if you will. They're looking at data. They're thinking about these horses in a new way. What are the resources you would advise people to look at that you think have informed your purchases? Um, so, so basically, it's form analysis. Um, and that can take on a, a number of roles. Stephen mentioned there he's keen on the stats. That is something to look at. Um, stats for trainers, stats for sires, um, all of those kind of things, be it the, the age of the horses, the, the type of ground that they want. You're comparing that back to their form. Video analysis is probably the biggest part of it for us. Um, looking for strong pieces of form. So basically the tools that we would use are anything that you would use in your day-to-day punting. Um, and the day-to-day following of the sport as a racing fan who, who likes a bet, that's what we're using. But also, what we're trying to find, it boils down to they're buying handicappers or horses that are going to be handicappers. And we're trying to find a horse that we believe is well handicapped. And therefore, if you put it in the right races, we'll, we'll go on and win. So there's a number of things that, you, that you're looking for, but it's the same things that you would look for in finding a bet really but the principal thing if we're looking for anything over anything else it's a horse that we think is on an attractive handicap mark and chris you know you've, you've sent me an exhaustive list which i'll circulate to everyone afterwards just because i think it's very illustrative of the, the efforts people go to find a good one. and what i think is interesting about it is you know there's about four, i think it's 43 44 horses on that list and only four of them have not won and they're peruvian lily wild acclaim sunbright and pageant master is there any of those kind of, you know, the lesser lights and lessons you learned from a horse you might have purchased that you kind of could now reflect on and maybe impart and uh, some advice when it doesn't go quite so well? Yeah, um, there's actually another one that didn't win, Mullionaire, who never got to the track. I, I, I marked him down as a disappointment. He was the biggest disappointment in a sense because we did actually syndicate him off and sold half of him to other people and he was going really well. And then he, he basically had a knee problem, required box rest, and then he flipped over in his box and hurt himself even worse and, and had to be put down. So that was one that, that went particularly um, badly and was disappointing. Peruvian Lily, I don't think we've actually got to the bottom of yet. We've still got her. She's having a break. She had a few issues. I'm hoping that she'll come right and, and she might do okay over the winter. Um, Sunbright was an unraced horse. And Dennis was saying that he likes the unraced horses and he's going to, given the amount of success that he's had with it. We haven't really, I did buy another one at the back end of last year, um, who hopefully will book the trend for us so far. But when we bought them from horses in training as unraced horses, so basically just going on pedigree uh, analysis, really, and, and things like that, they haven't gone quite so well for us. But I, I think if you keep on having a go, then eventually it will come right. Um, while the claim was a disappointing horse, um, attitude was just never right um pageant master we've still got him he's going off to the sales but ultimately his wind hasn't been great and that has been the, the big problem that i think has ultimately affected his attitude um he could maybe do with another wind operation we gave him one it hasn't worked but to be honest he, it's just his wind that has held him back great well that's chris and all the success uh, he has had and uh, i suppose i invite everyone now to do you know questions for the panelists in terms of what will happen we've already had a, we've already had ter- over 30 on our uh, q a system and I, the first one i wanted to ask was michael Fitzsimons' question and i think it's you know i i, I have to agree with michael here you know i'm a pedig- pedigree man I, I i love a good filly that might um show a bit of talent on the race course that also gives a bit of fun to um, a syndicate or people that want to buy the horse themselves. Why have we not touched upon, Stephen, any fillies in this discussion? It seems to be only geldings. Yeah, I mean, I actually personally haven't bought too many fillies, uh, Jack. And and I said, uh, in terms of um, their resale value, you know, pedigree for fillies is very important. But you match match pedigree for a filly and and a filly then that has proven form or, or, or has got a nice rating that can go and do a job somewhere, they get quite expensive. And, and um, just, it's an angle we'll probably look into this year that we might try and look for a couple of those because there are some nice uh, fillies racing throughout the summer. Um, but these are 
uh, you know, the, the Colts and the Gellings, you know, in the Spurs, um, can, can sometimes be an awful lot cheaper than those Phillies, especially those nicely well-bred Phillies. But look at it. It's important that a Philly has pedigree in terms of resale value. It doesn't work out as a racehorse. Um, but, um, you know, you know, I, I, maybe Dennis could glean a bit more, but I haven't got a, had a whole bunch of find them. And Dennis, it's a question for you. And, you know, you're obviously a national hunt trainer as well. You're, you're a national hunt jockey as well. And, you know, there is a uh, uh, kind of interest in you. You've had success with speed balls. You've had, you know, really talented sprinters. But, of course, you've also had success in the jumps game. And when you were approaching the horse and training sale to try and find a jumper, you know, what does that look, how does that differ from your, what you've discussed so far? How, how do you find something that might be able to uh, uh, thrive over the winter team? Uh, I suppose, Jack, I ended up, of course, going to horse and training sales looking for horses to go jumping. And that's still what we do, a dual purpose horse. So we're, looking for, we're looking for a mile and a quarter plus flat horses who rated as high as we can afford. Um, to go jump and that's originally how I ended up getting into the flat game so we buy so many jumpers we didn't stay or potential jumpers we didn't stay and we ended up having to go back flat next thing a few turned out to be quite well handicapped or improved in the winter break so that's how we ended up with the flat and I'm really enjoying the flat now and we probably have a bit more flat than jumps these days but just getting back to the to the Phillies question that Stephen had there um I've I've been lucky enough. With the, I like I like buying the national fillies because I think the pro in Ireland is brilliant for fillies now. This EBF scheme, um, there's a couple of mares maidens every week, um, five grand bonus scheme. I just found on the flat with the fillies, maybe in the auction maidens, but it's very hard. There's such good. There's so many good fillies in Ireland in, in from the big studs. I found it very hard looking at even a, even a Phillies handicap worth a few quid now. Um, very hard to compete with the big guns, Jack. Uh, but over jumps, there's a chance for a Philly. Yeah, it's all it's all those pesky breeders buying all these lovely Phillies, of course. Uh, but uh, you know, a question for you, Chris, and it's from uh, George O'Malley, and he's talking about the resale market. You know, the, and he's not talking about just the resale market in terms of. You know, you bought that horse from the horse and training sale, but you know sometimes the horse and training purchase um, you bit make you sell on again. You know, the third sale market, if you will, and you might you might talk a little bit about Space Bandit because I think he's an interesting tale. <laughs> yeah, Space Bandit was was one that that went really well for us. Um, on the wider point, before I get to Space Bandit about retail beyond that, that is something that that we're definitely looking at when we're buying. When the day we buy, we've already got in mind where we hope the horse will get to and where it's likely to move on to. Now, most of the horses that we've had ultimately end up going abroad, um, and a, a few of them have, have gone on to, to be nice horses. Um, a horse called Mythkal won a few races in America, he, he probably wasn't didn't do as well as what the people who bought him wanted, but he, he still won races. And, Horse called Future Score, we only kept for one run um, because ultimately we, we got an offer at the right time that we were happy to take and he was a quick turnaround for a horse that we paid eight grand for. He's done really well in Australia with Matt Kamani, but we're always looking at part of the price we pay is what we think we'll get back ultimately, even if things just go averagely, what will we get out at? Because we, we need to run it in that fashion because of the turnover of horses that we have. Um, so, so that's the, the first point. So far as Space Bandit was concerned, well, he's a case in point for not listening to what you hear because basically whenever you asked anyone, they just said that they couldn't recommend him. And everyone was seeing that and, and he was a horse that we bought for two grand and ended up selling for 50 grand. Um, and he won three races in between. Um, the reason we bought him was that there was a lot of reasons to not buy him. So he was always going to be very cheap. But there was two big reasons to buy him. The first one was his pedigree. He was a half-brother to Water Welcome, who just that season was in the process of progressing rapidly um, for age and maturity. And the second was the way that he shaped on his debut. And it goes back to video analysis. He, he finished fifth, I think it was, at Yarmouth. 
he signed without parole, who went on to win Group One Company. I think he won at, he won at Royal Ascot, didn't he? And Ostilio was second, who won Britannia, I think, that year at Royal Ascot. Um, and he'd run behind those two horses on his debut, and he was the only one that looked anywhere near the same league as them through that race. But ultimately, he dropped away. Now, he, on the back of that, had a, a, a fractured pelvis, nothing too serious, but it was something that had kept him off. And he turned at the sale, having just been on a treadmill, looking like he hadn't been doing much. And basically, horse had been off the track. No one really wanted to buy him. But uh, the money that he was, we just felt, well, he's worth a pop because of the way that he'd shaped on his debut. Okay, so there you have it. Two grand into 50, 115 rated sprinters and Premier Handicap winners. For our three experts this evening, it's all seemed a bit of an easy, easy game. It's also interesting to reflect. You know, you go to a horse and training catalogue and you think, pedigree, what, what point is that? It's all about the form book, but a lot of the success we've discussed tonight has actually been horses that are well-related that actually improve, which I think is a really interesting takeaway. But uh, and it's a question um, from uh, Mark Dwyer. And that's, uh, Mark wants to know, you know, Stephen and uh, Dennis, your best place to answer this, and perhaps to you, Stephen, first. Is there any horse at a horse and training sale in the recent days, and perhaps we haven't seen it for Ada McGuinness yet, that you would highlight to people listening in tonight as, as one to watch? Yeah, well, I suppose the, 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 the sprinter we bought last October, there, that laugh a minute, um, high profile stakes performer from Roger Varians. We, we, we had to give 100,000 for the horse, but, you know, he's a, he's a, as I said, when you, when, when you look at and you look at these unraced horses that Dennis has developed in two high-profile sprinters, you'd be very env envious of what we we're after depending on, on, a, on a horse. And, and this is only rated 100. Now, this was a horse rated as high as 109. So we, we think that there is a big handicap in this horse before he, 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 he does take on Dennis's two sprinters at some stage. During the okay, there you have it. Last minute from Stephen. And uh, Dennis, to you, is there, is there another make a challenge or sceptical lurking in the, uh, uh, with you at the moment? There's a nice horse, Jack, um, called Dalvi. He's a Dan Silly. I think he was an unraced Judmont. Um, James and Stephen bought him. They, they, uh, they loved him. Again, fine big specimen. Um, top class pedigree. Um, again, wrong of his wind. Has had the wind up. Has been working super. We're looking forward to getting him started. But as you all know, the maidens are going to be ferociously competitive when we kick off, I'd say. With so many horses, a backlog of being ready. So, um, just could be could be one to watch. We we, we really like him, and uh, we we hope he's useful. Okay, so there you have it. Um, we've had a great discussion, an hour long. All of it. Another point. I might just add another point there. Uh, just watch, Stephen. Just if, if if for those out there that are watching, anyone that's engaging in an, in a trainer or an agent at a horse and training sale, um, I just feel it. I've had a, a very, very bad, uh, uh, a bad problem a couple of years ago with regards to fall of hammer insurance. And I just feel in order for people to protect themselves with these horses coming home from sales, transportation home to the yard, two weeks fall of hammer insurance is very, very important. And I, 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 There was a, a very good friend of mine last year who bought a, a 70 grand horse in the ring. He went down the chute and heading back down the barn to, to, his, um, to his stable and he flipped up and landed on the concrete. He was in a hospital, uh, an equine hospital, 24 hours later, the horse is dead. Now, the owner of that horse, only he was a very, you know, in, a, in the position he was to, to cancel the sale on that horse. There's a 70 grand there, debt there to somebody, you know, that someone owes. Yeah. So I think fall of hammer insurance is very, very important and it shouldn't be overlooked when going buying, whether it's a five grand horse or a, or a hundred grand horse at the sale. Okay, so fall on the hammer of the hammer insurance, very important. Uh, Chris, any imparting words from you in terms of what, you, what advice you'd give that we perhaps maybe haven't touched upon in the discussion? Uh, I'd, I'd echo what Stephen just said, because the horse that we discussed mainly for our biggest success, Big Country, um, went on with um, colic due to post-sales stress um, pretty much on the day that we bought him and he wasn't far off being lost that horse uh, on that occasion he ultimately came absolutely fine but um yeah, it, it was a it was a worry and we pretty much felt that we'd done our money straight off so that's something to uh, to bear in mind uh, i didn't say anything about the fillies 
I, I think they are there. The, the key point about the fillies is that you, you're not going to get as much pedigree as what you do with a cast-off colt or gelding um, for, for your money. And pedigree is something that we've discussed a, a few times. Um, but we did well with a, a filly called Merriweather, uh, who we bought last last autumn from Ray Beckett. She's had a, a good time of things. And I think there's a little bit more to come from her. Uh, and the other thing I'd add is just a, a horse to keep on the right side. We, we've got one or two that I don't think we've got to the bottom of yet. And Garsman, who's two from two since we bought him um, on the all-weather, uh, he's doing everything right at the moment. He's progressing nicely. and I think there's more wins in him. OK. Great. And Dennis, final word to you. Um, anything you, we haven't discussed tonight, did you just say to people that are watching in, that's something to bear in mind when you come to the horse and training sales? Yeah, I suppose similar to what Stephen said there. That that is that is a very valid point. Um, but again, I suppose that to potential potential investors or buyers, know your trainer, we're in to trust them. Um, and I suppose you, you have to be lucky. So, but like you, you do need to know who you're dealing with. Likewise, we need to know who we're dealing with. And I suppose you, you need to have things in place when you're spending a few quid beforehand. You know? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much to our three panelists. We're going to we're launching our book club now. So in three weeks' time, we're going to read Horse Trader, my favourite book um, about racing, which I'd really recommend you uh, you delve into and you give a go. It's available in ebook. Um, it's a terrific read and a very easy read. Um, so I would encourage you to do so. I'm going to be announcing who is going to be on the panel to uh, join our book club for that, which would be great. Next week, uh, we've got pin hookers, something that a lot of people wanted to hear about. Um, so if you've got suggestions of pin hookers you want to hear from. We'd love to hear it. Um, they, uh, there's some absolutely geniuses in that field. So I'm really looking forward to that discussion next Sunday at 6. Um, and uh, if you've any feedback from me, send to at Jack Cantillon. We, of course, still have shares available in our bargain breezer from last week, which has been a huge success. And if you want to be involved with that, just send me a quick mail at Jack Cantillon. But that's it for this week. Hope you've enjoyed. Thank you very much to our three panellists. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys.